total impartial languages. And today I want to, so, so far we started talking, we were looking at, so if we look at T and F and some of their variants, these things are total, okay? And we're able to prove a termination theorem, which tells you that you cannot write anything that diverges. You can never get into an infinite loop. Now, you can get into a, a loop that is infinite for all practical purposes, but it's not an infinite loop, okay? And the idea is that every single expression you write down, if it's well-typed, it has a value. Okay, so that's what we've been doing so far. Things are very nice and clean and simple in that setting, but they're not uh, very practical, okay? And I'll explain theorems that govern why they're not very practical. Okay, so one of the meta messages I'm always trying to get across to you is, uh, <coughs> excuse me, is to try to elevate the discussion of programming languages out of the tar pit of opinion and turn it into a proper science. And in fact, in a minute I'm going to mention uh, the one that I know of, the one scientific law that governs computer science. We'll, we'll get to that in a minute. So what we're going to do today is we're going to study the E. coli of, of, uh, of, uh, of uh, partial programming languages, something called PCF. And that, uh, that I would think of as the E. coli of, of partial languages. And what it's all about, what is the idea, the key idea? Well, uh, from a programming point of view, is it's going to look a lot more familiar, although the formulation might not. But the key idea, what, what this is really about, is extending the theory of computability. In fact, this is what programming languages research is all about anyway. Okay, but this is the, like, the, 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 the extending the theory of computability to, as we say, higher type. You see, when they teach it, so there's a very unfortunate thing that happens, okay, in the secondary literature and popularizations, which is people forget Okay, and or if you look, or what's one way to say about it, the other way to look at it, say about it is look at your textbooks. The only discussion of computability you get from in, in a typical university course is computation over the natural numbers. That's all you ever study. So this is the completely standard thing. This is the standard account. And it's often considered the theory of computability. Okay, well that's complete nonsense. Okay, that's complete nonsense. It's a perfectly nice first cut, okay, about the theory of computability back in the 1930s to say, let's worry about what it means to compute over finitary objects, things that are given uh, wholly to you by, say, a number. It might as well be a number. Why? Because you can do things like code up pairs of numbers as numbers. So. Anything sort of finite and right in front of you, I can just represent as a number. That's a very, really great start in the 1930s, okay? But what, a, what does it mean? The theory of computation in your textbook, okay, says nothing about what is a computable function of type, uh, what is a computable function O of type, I don't know, I'll just write something down, n arrow n, arrow n arrow n. Your textbook says nothing about this. Nowhere, that's not even mentioned, not even considered as a possibility. And this would be called a computable operator, or we would call it a higher order function. Okay, so this is a computable operator. Okay, now Kleene in the 50s, for all of his uh, prescience, prescience in many, many ways, did in, in fact initiate the study of higher type computability, but it's a bit of esoterica. Okay, even if you take a class in recursion theory in the math department, they're almost, it's almost sure they're not going to talk about this. Okay, it's bizarre because this is what we care about. So what happens is, is the theory of programming languages is really the theory of computability at higher type. Okay, that's the starting point. But moreover, to higher type, and I'll even write, how about if I write just other type? Okay, it's other types. Okay, 
That is, there's all sorts of other things we can talk about. We can talk about, for example, what does it mean to compute with state, things like this. Different ideas of what are models of computation. Never are these addressed, okay? They tell you, oh, all you need to know is about the Turing machine. Come on, that's, uh, that's like a joke. Of course not, that's, 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 not, that's not what it's all about. Okay, so, so it's an interesting fact that, the, that this is the way things has developed, and it's a shame. So what we're going to do is with, with PCF, the purpose of PCF was this, this problem, to extend theory of computability to higher type. Okay, so that's what's going on. It's called the Programming Language for Computable Functions. That's what PCF stands for, okay? So that's where that comes from, and it was introduced by Gordon Plotkin. Okay, so he uh, introduced PCF. Okay, so the way I'm going to motivate this is I want to start out by getting you to think in a way that you may not be used to thinking. Okay, and that's the, that's the thing that I, uh, thinking about things in a, yeah, okay. So, for example, in any sort of textbook on discrete math or something, like there's lots and lots and lots of places where you can see that GCD, I'll use this, is defined by the following, they're sometimes called recursion equations or just equations. And what I want you to do is I want you to think about this in a way that maybe, so a typical definition is something like M, if M equals N, watch me screw this up, it's too early in the morning, but you'll get my idea. And, and Okay, it'll look like that. Sometimes people will write mod here. Well, that's fine. It just means do all your subtractions in one go. Okay, so you, you can write mod, m mod n, and n mod m, but I don't care about that. Okay, so people write that down, and they say that's the definition. And in fact, in many cases, you can just transcribe this into, uh, into typical programming languages. Uh, in, in an evident way. So if I were doing ML, I would write fun out here, and then I'd write vertical bar and vertical bar here, and then I'd have to do something about the if. So I'll explain what to do about the if. Some languages like Haskell, it's a nice thing. They'll have a vertical bar, I think it is, M equals N, and a vertical bar, M greater than N, and a vertical bar, N minus M, and then they use some other syntax here, I forget. Okay, so, but you get the gist. You can transcribe this directly, especially in functional languages, which are halfway civilized. You can write down something nice like that. Okay, now here comes the thing that I want you to think about. For many of you, not all of you, but for many of you, I suspect it's a very different way of thinking about it. Okay, so you can think of this as a recursive function. And you're taught that. Okay, and you can think of it as that using recursion and words like that, okay? And what is the very next thing that the professor does with you when they start talking about this, okay? So mentally transcribe that notation into your favorite language, if it's Haskell or ML, or you could do it in Java. It gets increasingly painful, but, uh, it, but in essence, that's the code. Let's, let's agree that's the code, right? Where you're okay with that, right? Okay. What's the next thing in you know, CS 101 that your professor told you about, about how to understand what's going on here? What is the very next thing they did, do you remember? What's the first thing you think of? You, you don't know where I'm heading? No, nobody's guessed where I'm heading? Well, the next thing that they always talk about, the next topic is always some mysterious thing called a stack. <laughs> okay, all right? It has bugger all to do with stacks. Nothing, okay? So this is what I'm gonna talk about. So the next topic, the next typical topic, is some nonsense about stacks. Now why is it nonsense, okay? It's complete nonsense. Now, you're, you're getting used to the fact now that I, uh, I, I seem to have contradictory 
I seem to contradict anything you've ever been told. Yes, well, then you're glad you're here. <laughs> okay. So, all right, nonsense. Why is it nonsense? Well, take your Java program. Where the, where the hell is this damn stack thing? Okay, God knows they start drawing pictures and waving their hands vigorously, okay? Because there's no stack to be found anywhere in like Java or ML or Haskell, okay? So that's one thing, it's like, where's the stack? Another reason why it's nonsense is that, uh, that it has nothing to do with stacks. It's completely irrelevant. It has nothing to do with stacks. Recursion has nothing to do with stacks, nothing. Okay, if I can get you to carry away one thing, okay, from, from Opless Summer School, recursion has nothing to do with stacks. Let me give you another example, which you might have seen in a textbook. How do you make an RS latch? You take two NOR gates, okay, and we have these inputs that work like this, and you feed this guy back here, and you feed this guy back here. So you make this sort of cross-coupled network of gates. Okay, so what is a NOR gate? It's a stream transducer because the purpose of a clock and the computer is to make sure you have a waveform that looks like that so we can say one, one, zero, one. Okay, it's a stream of bits. Okay, that's why you have a clock, so that you make decisions are definite. Okay, all right, so yeah, it's a stream transducer. It's a function from two streams to one. And what is being defined here? Well, if I label all the inputs, if I call that x and y, and x prime and y prime, I'm writing down, so exercise, write the recursion equations. That correspond to this definition. It's just, just like writing what for the GCD. The output of this is the input of that, et cetera. You just write them down as a system of equations. Okay, that's what you do. And now, the next time your professor tells you that recursion has something to do with stacks, what you do is you say, oh yeah? Where's the stack on the chip? <laughs> There's no stack in your Java program or whatever it is you learned, okay? Nor is there a stack on the chip because recursion and self-reference has nothing whatsoever to do with stacks. It's bullshit, okay? I'll explain where it comes up, okay? But it's total bullshit, all right? All right, it's a pity, but it's, it's such a shame. The fact that the ignorance of programming language theory leads to people teaching all sorts of nonsense, and it becomes like true quotes by social convention. But it's not true, <laughs> okay? So it's completely crazy. Okay, so here's a better way to think about it. So here's a better idea, which, by the way, is the correct idea. The correct idea is always a better idea, okay? So the, here's the correct idea. Okay, this is what I have to teach you. Okay, this is important. When I write down a system of equations like that, it's a system of simultaneous equations, just like you learned, for example, in linear algebra. And I'm look, it's not linear algebra, but it's similar. Think of that as a system of simultaneous equations. So I have simultaneous equations. In the variable GCD. <coughs> ah, that's the weird thing. Because like in your elementary math, variables always range over the real numbers or maybe the complex numbers. I want now variables that range over functions. That's GCD, okay? So what I'm doing is I'm saying solve for GCD. That's what I'm doing. I'm solving those equations for GCD, and then I'm going to talk you through why such a system of equations ought to have a solution, okay? So the idea is let's write it out. We can really write it out as one equation. What we're doing is we're saying GCD is equal to, let's write it like this, Okay, if, what did I write? I'm just using some kind of blackboard notation that I'm making up. Okay, if m equals n, then the answer is m. Otherwise, if m is greater than n, then GCD of m minus n and n, else GCD of m and n minus n. 
Okay, so now I have one equation. Okay, because what's going on here is let's write that as G with occurrences of GCD in it. In other words, capital G has a hole here and has a hole here. Okay, so we can think of G as lambda f dot, all the stuff above, except here you write f and here you write f, okay? So that you're looking for, so what you want is GCD such that GCD satisfies the equation that it's G of GCD. That's what you're doing. When you're looking with the gates, it's the same thing, okay? You're trying to find a solution to some simultaneous equations, and the outputs here, uh, you know, the out I forget the typical outputs like Q and X. Oh, I shouldn't have called that X. Anyway, one of these ends, I, I can never remember it off the top of my head. One of these ends up being R, and the other one is S. For This is an RS latch, and I forget which is R and which is S. And we don't bother giving that a name because they're only used internally to the circuit. So the fact that these leads come in, that we can forget. Uh, oh, that isn't what I want. This one would be S. And then these feedback. I think it's usually written something like that. Okay. So, uh, so the point is you're solving a system of equations. You're trying to find two streams, Q and X, that satisfy simultaneously equations given by these gates. That's what you're actually doing. Okay. There's no mention... There are no stacks involved, okay? You see, it's, it's amazing, okay? I'll explain to you separately why people think there's a stack involved, but there isn't, okay? So this is the idea, and this is called a fixed point. We mentioned this last time. And what Dan is going to do in his lecture is he's going to talk about fixed points where you're solving type equations. You have equations between types, and you say, I want to find the solution of that. Ah, okay, so that's why the method to my madness here, okay? Now, the first thing that I will point out is it, it only makes sense. That is, the solution always exists, provided that you're working with computable functions, computable partial functions. Now, there's a very fascinating story, okay, about how, how and why this is the case. I can't go into all of that here. You might be surprised to find out, if you're not familiar with this, the central notion is that you can talk about computable functions in terms of the notion of continuity, which is limit preservation, which is the stuff you quickly forgot about after you took calculus, okay? It's all about topology. It's all about nearness and, uh, nearness and, and uh, measuring amounts of information, let's put it this way, that's going on. And in particular, dealing with preservation of limits. So what happens is, the reason this works is that capital G is, in a sense that I can't describe here, a continuous function. Okay? It's very important. We can think of it as just computable partial functions, but there's a beautiful theory of computability that's based on the ideas of continuity, and this goes back to Brouwer in the 1930s, okay, the founder of constructive mathematics. Okay? So uh, I won't be able to explain that right now. Okay? But the thing I want to say is what we're doing is we're looking for a fixed point. So what we're going to do, the way PCF is organized, is it looks like this. It looks a little bit like T, but I want to make something really important. I use the harpoon here because I want to emphasize that it's partial functions. So it's sort of, you know, I left off a part, you know. So it's partial functions, okay? It's very important. A lot of times people just write the usual arrow, but you must understand that it means partial functions because none of this makes any sense if you're not in that setting, okay? So we have partial functions, so I'll write it like that. And that's it. So it has the same type system as Gödel's T, okay? And it has the same system of expressions. So I'll just write dot, dot, dot. Exactly the same as in, oh, no, it's not quite the same. Let me write it out. There's a minor difference because of, uh, you'll, you'll see. Okay, uh, so we have zero. We have a successor of E. 
And instead of a recursor, we have if z. And if z is written like this, x dot e1. OK, that's that. So what does it mean here? I'm testing whether this is 0. If it's 0, it evaluates to this. If it's non-zero, it binds x to the predecessor and then evaluates to this. Oh, it does, like if you do, if you design your language run based on these kinds of general principles, you won't get into ridiculous models about like the undefinedness of predecessor on zero. You don't have to deal with that because you see you're given the predecessor as part of examining what what e is. This is an instance of pattern matching. So you're familiar with pattern matching in ML or Haskell languages like that. This is an instance of pattern matching. Okay, so that's the civilized way to do things. Okay, so we write it like that. So it's if z instead of the iterator, okay, or recursor. And uh, now the, we have lambda as before, of course, and we have application. And now the new thing. The new thing is we have fix, I'll write it like this, at some type tau x dot e, because it's going to stand for the fixed point, okay? And informally, I'll just write fix x is e. Okay, that's the way, the way I'll write that at the board typically. Okay, so this is the critical idea. The critical idea is what could be called general recursion. So let me go back over here and mention two things. It's inherently partial because you might ask yourself, what if I say solve the equation GCD is equal to GCD? Well, it has a solution. Okay, and the solution would be the, the simplest or the least solution in a way that, in a sense that I won't define in this lecture, is the totally undefined function satisfies that equation. Or what if I said to you, you know, GCD, so this is a way of writing GCD MN equals GCD MN, and I really mean lambda M, lambda N, and lambda M, and lambda N. Okay, well, but you could write it like that. But Suppose I said GCD of MN is one more than the GCD of MN. Of course, these things have nothing to do with GCD anymore, but I'm just saying uh, I wrote down such an equation, okay? In other words, I screwed up the recursion equations, perhaps, okay? Well, what are we supposed to make of that, okay? See, because I'm claiming this has a solution, okay, in the class of partial functions. Okay, it doesn't have any solution if this has to be total, right? Because then you would have, this would be P, and P would have to be one plus P, and that's not gonna work, okay, over the natural numbers. But if it's partial functions, I can solve for GCD, because in both cases, the totally undefined function works. Okay, the totally undefined function works. That's a solution, because if this just diverges, you know, has no, de no, no definition, then so does this have no definition, okay? Because you can't figure out what one more than undefined is without, if it's undefined. Ah, that's how this is working, okay? So this is the, this is the trick, okay? So the idea is this stands for the solution, I'll write it out more carefully, the solution to x equals e, where, let me emphasize, by putting a subscript there, the E can have an X in it, of course. That's the point. Okay? So I can solve, so let's write, let's write, I'll make this definition, it's always called bottom, okay, for some reason that I, I'm not going to develop here. Okay, uh, it's, al it's always called bottom. By the way, bottom doesn't mean whatever the hell you feel like it means, okay? It has a very specific definition in the theory, but I'm not going to, it gets thrown around as if like, you know, random. But anyway, uh, there's, a, there's a theory that I'm uh, giving you a glimpse of, and then this means a least element in a certain preorder. That's what matters, okay? All right, so you can't, like if you have an error condition, you can't just say, oh, it's bottom. It's like you're nuts, okay? What are you talking about? So fix xx, I'll call that bottom at type tau. And in, in a minute we'll see why, uh, precisely, but this is undefined, okay? In other words, it, it just, it, well, what we'll see is it has no value. What I mean by that is it has no value. And I'll, I'll explain when I give the dynamics, but that, that's the idea. 
So what I would do is the way in which I define GCD is I say GCD is by definition fixed, and what is the type? It's nat arrow nat, partial arrow nat of G. And notice, in, well, or if you want to write x dot g of x, so that we can, I'll often just cheat on that and just write g. Okay, x dot g of x. Notice, there's no occurrence of GCD here. In other words, it's a proper definition because it no longer occurs on the right-hand side. I'm saying that identifier stands for that expression, and that's a perfectly good expression that makes sense without any mention of that identifier, unlike the original formulation. Okay? So I've reduced it to solving a fixed point equation. Okay, so now I, I, uh, what we're going to do is we're going to talk about fix a lot. This is not the only application of fix. Okay, there's lots, of, it's not just for defining functions, but what I'm saying is we can solve recursion equations over any type, even higher type. Okay, that's the important thing. Now, I can only, this is one of these kind of eat your spinach things, uh, and at this very moment I don't know how to do, do anything other than to say that, but uh, at the level of eat your spinach, you really have to start, if you're not already in the habit, because you're already in the habit, good, that's great. But for those of you who haven't had the experience, you must start thinking in terms of fixed points and solving equations if you want to do really slick, sophisticated programming. Okay? That's what I will tell you. Okay. So that's it. Eat your spinach. You've got to learn how to, you've got to, learn how to think this way. If you ha most of you, I'll, I'll, I'll just like surmise, have never been taught this kind of thing before unless you happen to study some advanced PL class. But you certainly weren't taught this when you were a freshman. We teach this, okay, okay, but anyway, I'll, I'll mention that. Okay, so that's fixed. All right, so the, the second thing that I want to mention before I move on, before I get into the details of this, is you might say, well, there's all this, you know, in some sense, the partiality is a big pain in the butt. I can now get infinite loops and stuff. It's very annoying, okay? What, so every five years or so, some joker comes along and says, oh, I know, we'll only have total functions, okay? And, and it's just like, okay, here we go, another round of the guy who wants only total functions. Let me tell you something about this, okay? A theorem governs the scenario, okay? It's not like, oh, the guru guy comes up with some creative idea and then other people who don't know any better follow. No, there's a theorem. I want to tell you about something about the Blum size theorem, just briefly. Number one, okay, challenge. If you think you're a good hacker, okay, define GCD in T, and use all the products you want, I don't care. In fact, using products, and even just to avoid making it annoying, let yourself have subtraction. Okay, you can define it, but in order not to, you can put sums, I don't care, okay. Do what you like. Uh, give yourself subtraction, because that's not where the problem is, okay. Give yourself a quality test or less than, you know, inequality. That's not where the problem lies. All that can be written down, that's not the issue. So, you know, be generous to yourself. Give yourself all the little auxiliary things you want. Try to define GCD and T. If you figure it out, I would be very impressed, okay? It's not easy at all, okay? And in fact, you're gonna find that it's actually rather awful, okay? But you can do it, okay? You can do it. It's, okay, now let me tell you why it's hard because that's part two, okay? All right, part two it comes to the theorem. So why is it hard? So first of all, you just have to take a crack at it. And some of you, some of you might come up with it. I don't know. It could be, okay? But, so I won't underestimate you, but I will challenge you. Okay, so, but why is it, what fundamentally makes this thing hard? It's not that you're dumb, okay? What makes it hard is you must bake the termination code into the proof. The uh, termination proof into the code. I don't know what I said. The termination... Let's bake the termination proof into the code. 
You see, every five years when some joker comes along and starts talking about having only total functions, maybe in certain very limited circumstances, that might be just the ticket. But for a per general purpose programming, no, okay? Here's why. Because what does it mean for a programming language to be total? It means that in order to be well-typed, all of the reasoning that went into why it's total must be baked into the way you wrote the code to make it completely apparent. In other words, you've got to reduce it in the case of Gödel's T to just a bunch of for loops. Oh, this is going to make it miserable. Okay, it's really miserable. It's got to be in the code. The termination proof has to be in the code, not your head. I apologize if some, if some one of you is working on a total programming language. I don't mean to insult you, but consider it that a wake-up call. All right. So whatever you do, you better be able to answer what I'm writing. Okay. So let me put it that way. All right. Okay. So you must be able to ba you must bake the termination proof into the code. Any of you know about the Colatz function and the Colatz conjecture? Okay. Look it up on Wikipedia. I can't remember the definition off the top of my head. There's a little definition of a, re a recursive function that's no more complicated than GCD. It's uh, some crazy thing about 3n plus 1 and something or other. I forgot, right? Something like that. Somebody knows. Okay. What's that? It's, it's what? You half it in the even, and if it's odd, then you triple plus 1. All right. Okay. Yeah. Okay. You have it if it's even, and you, and you, and you do 3n plus 1 if it's odd. Thanks. Okay. That's... So it, it ain't no different than the GCD and superficial, you know, looking at it superficially, right? We, we agree. It's no more complicated to write down. No one knows, despite very serious effort, no one knows whether it terminates. But I can promise you, if in the New York Times tomorrow somebody said that somebody so-and-so solved the Colatz conjecture, you can bet your ass that that proof is going to be stupendous, Okay. So now, if you're in a total programming language to program the Colatz function, you're going to have to bake that whole damn proof. So let me tell you about the Blum size theorem. All this is a theorem. It's not just an opinion. Okay? The Blum size theorem. Approximately, it says the following thing. I'll write it a little bit loosely. Okay? Uh, fix a total programming language. TL, you know, say T. Uh, let's say we could do it for T. Why don't we just do T? Okay. Okay, so what we do is fix an expansion factor. Pick whatever expansion factor you want. Let's call it, uh, say, I don't know, something really awful. How about 2 to the 2 to the n? Or whatever you like. 2 to the 2 to the 2 to the 2 to the, to the n. Pick whatever you like. Okay. Pick your expansion factor. Okay. There is a function, f, on the natural numbers, a mathematical function on the natural numbers, whose shortest program, its shortest program, shortest program in t is 2 to the 2 to the n, or whatever you would like to say, longer than its code in PCF. Because in PCF, I just write down those equations. If you manage to solve part one, you will see that your code does not look as pretty as that. Okay? Why? So this is a theorem. This is a fact. Okay? This is uh, around 1968 or thereabouts. F funny that nobody ever told you this, right? You've never heard of it, right? Except possibly from me. <laughs> I'm like the only one who promotes the bomb size there. Okay? Uh, no? Anyone ever heard of it before? Funny that you haven't heard of that. I don't know. Why do people not teach you these things? Okay. Well, so in other words, the effort of writing this is exemplifying the phenomenon that's absolutely made precise by the Blum size theorem. So the next time somebody comes along and tells you they're gonna, their brilliant ideas, we're only going to have total function, we're going to get rid of all this partiality, please ask them, okay, but what about the Blum size theorem? 99% chance that the, the what? They've never heard of it. Okay? So this will be in your back pocket. You can do that. Okay, so if you're working on something like this, then you better be able to tell me what you're going to do about the Blum size theorem. Okay? So
So you can't take uh, such languages seriously. They're not good for programming. OK, so now let's go on and talk about PCF. I have a lot to say about PCF. I have many more things going on. OK. <clears throat> because a, a mall in particular is going to make very essential use of one of the key ideas that I want to express about PCF. So that's the really the, the back story of my lecture. I want to make sure that the, the thing that a mall is going to rely on is, is mentioned to you. OK. Oh, what? Yeah. Suppose that we're trying to write a program that we know will terminate in the end. Yes. Uh, so if we try to write it in a total language, it might be very long. <coughs> yes. But if we choose a partial language, we might be able to write it really short, but the proof will probably be really long. Yeah, exactly. But you break the proof out of the code. You don't have to program it in such a way that it's self-evidently total. So you think even in these situations, partial languages will be useful as long as you can write proof Yes, that is my actual opinion. Okay. Yes. OK, all right, so yes, we'll get to that. Independent types change faster? Well, oh, sorry? Question about T. Do dependent types change the <coughs> result? Does it change the? The result that makes your T programs big. Besides the it's got nothing to do with T. Fix any, any programming language in which all you can ever write are total, are total functions. I specialize the size theorem to T. Blum's size theorem doesn't actually mention Gödel's T at all. It's just that an instance of Blum's size theorem is for Gödel's T. Just for pedagogical convenience. OK. <clears throat> OK, so now what I want to do is talk about this. So let's look at the statics. That's straightforward. All right, everything you could guess, I'll just write the one important thing. What is the typing rule for fix at type tau x dot e? That's of type tau. Assuming it's of type tau, it is of type tau. Notice it's the same tau in each of three places. OK, at all those three places. And the crucial thing, which should not be surprising, is you assume what you're trying to prove. Why do I say you're assuming what you're trying to prove? Well, informally, fix xe stands for substitute fix xe for x and e, because it's a solution to a recursion equation. So what, and I'll explain this precisely in a minute. So it, the x here stands for the whole fix. That's how you're referring to yourself, OK? So you assume the very thing that you're trying to prove, you assume while you're showing and you show that that assumption is tenable. OK, got it? You show that the assumption is tenable. Assume that it's the case. Show that nothing contradicts that fact, and then it just is the case. This is the essence of partiality. I don't ever show anything absolutely outright. I just assume what I'm trying to prove and consider that sufficient to be true, because I don't care if this thing diverges, because like, I'm dealing with partial maps. I'm dealing with partiality here. OK, so that's the clever idea. So let's match it up with the dynamics, and then you'll see why you'll see what I mean. So what is the dynamics? Well, it's extremely simple. You substitute This is just like saying f steps to f, uh, oh, sorry, e for x, uh, uh, f for x, e. That's the pattern that I'm writing down here. It can, it's a little heavy on your eyes to keep track that I'm writing the same thing here and there. So you can write it like that, OK? This is called the unrolling of the recursion. OK, that's the, that's the idea. OK? So what it means is, for example, if GCD is defined by a fix, as I mentioned, GCD as a function will step to 
lambda m, lambda n, that's the way we'll, we'll write all this down at some point. Oh, yeah, I forgot that. Uh, up there in front of the if should have been lambda m, lambda n, because I'm defining a function. I, I, I forgot to write that there when I wrote it down earlier. That's a little typo. OK, if, OK, m equals n, then m, et cetera, I'll just write et cetera. OK, it steps to that. So the idea is if I then apply it to m and n, it'll check whether they're equal. And then at some point, it'll find itself in the process of evaluating GCD again, which is this fix, OK? GCD is defined to be a fix. It's fix, you know, uh, g dot lambda m, lambda n, et cetera. OK, that's what GCD is, OK? And you'll encounter that fix again, and then you'll unroll it again. So the idea is that you're one step ahead. You're one step ahead. Because if I apply GCD to 3 and 5, I don't know, OK, I uh, just do that. Well, that's an application. Or if you want to curry it, then apply to 3, apply to 5, whatever, OK? How do you evaluate that? The first thing you do is you evaluate the function. The function is a fix. And it steps to, well, in this case, lambda m, lambda n with some fixes in here. Okay, so you have to evaluate it. So what you do when you evaluate it is you say, oh, 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 we're about to use this guy. Let's hurry up and we'll get one step ahead. Okay, and then I'll plug in three and five, and then it'll check whether they're equal, da, 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 and then you'll get back to doing the fix again, and it quickly unrolls right in front of you. So it's just unrolling the carpet one step in front of your walking, of your pacing. You unroll it as you go along. Okay, that's the idea. So you're walking along here, and the carpet is being unrolled while you uh, stand here looking ahead. Okay, so that's what we're doing. So this unrolls. In the next instance, we have infinitely many minions who are unrolling the carpet as we go along. Okay, so that's the idea. All right, so that's, the, uh, that's what we're doing. Are you with me so far? So now, check preservation. Suppose fix, I'll just write x dot e, is of type tau. And we suppose that it takes a step. Well, the step it takes is to what I just told you, fix x e for x in e, right? And what I want to show is that this is of type tau. Is it? Well, what do I know by this fact? By inversion of the inference rules, we know that given the assumption that it's of type tau, it is indeed of type tau. But this is assumed to be of type tau. So we substitute and use the substitution lemma. And when we do the substitution lemma, we get that that's of type tau. We're done. So preservation works. The type system makes sense. So you can see, that's why we're assuming what we're trying to prove. We assume that x is of type tau, and then we plug in the very thing, OK? And well, that's what we're assuming is of type tau. So of course, I can plug it in. And when I plug it in, then I get that this is of type tau, because E maintains the fiction that its argument is of type tau, OK? That's the idea. Even though the fix may never, ever be defined, OK? That's what's important here. OK, so that's how we do that. So that's straightforward. Now let me mention some important things. OK, first of all, look at that dynamics. Stare really hard at that dynamics. Stare at it, really stare at that. Bear down on that dynamics, OK? That's the rule. That's the entire thing up there, OK? Have a look at that rule. Noodle over it as long as you want. And when you're ready, you're going to know what I'm going to say. Tell me, where's the stack? <laughs> There's no bloody stack, OK? It's nonsense. The point about recursion is self-reference, period. And that's it. Nothing else. There's no stacks, OK? Well, I, uh, another time I'll explain. All right, later on, I'll explain where, 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 the, where the mistake comes from. Here's another example about the stack. And now I want you to consider, oh, OK, right. So now I want to talk about the very important idea which comes up when we have partiality as evaluation order. And the two relevant questions are, 
is the successor, eager or lazy. And our functions, function call by name or by value. When we talked about total languages, I, I was able to sweep this all into the rug. rug. It doesn't matter. I, I don't care. Okay? Irrelevant. Because everything has a value, so there's no difference. However, in the presence of partiality and general recursion, the difference is of the essence. The choice matters enormously. And, and in other words, there are theorems that govern this. It's not a matter of opinion, okay? There's right and wrong here. And I'm going to explain what I mean by that. So another meta, well, anyway, okay. So good, so it's not a matter of opinion. So here's the thing I ask you. So let's look at number one. Suppose the successor, okay, <laughs> Uh, is eager, okay? Meaning that you have the rule that to evaluate a successor, you evaluate its argument, okay? Suppose it's eager. Then what do I know? Then I can, then, then what do I know is that, then I can say, what are, therefore, what are the values, okay, what are the values in that situation of type nat? Well, zero is a value, we won't change that. But for successor to be a value, we will insist that E be a value. So what does that mean? The values are the numerals. So that would be called n bar if those are n iterations of successor. Okay? The values are the numerals. The type of the natural numbers is, by God, the type of the natural numbers. And you can reason about it by mathematical induction, because the elements of the type are the natural numbers. Suppose, so we're just breaking this out, this is lazy. Uh-oh. So now we don't have this thing, and we don't have this thing. Okay? It is no longer the case that the natural numbers, the thing called nat, are the natural numbers. Why? Consider the following thing. Omega is by definition, fix x is successor of x. Well, this evaluates in, in one step to, this, is, this will be a value to omega. So this is, and this is a value. Okay? It's successor is, is defined like that. So now we can check for all finite n, so for all the numerals that like that, uh, so for all numerals, for all n bar, we have n bar is less than, strictly less than omega, meaning that this guy always has one more successor than this guy does. Count up all the successors here, and it'll still have one more. Why? Because it has as many as you like. Omega solves the equation, it's a fixed point for successor. It's what it, so how do you think about that? It's an infinite number. Well, I'll put that in scare quotes. Because it bloody well is not a number at all. Okay? So the point is, now you've made a mess. Because nat, the thing called nat, is not the natural numbers. And what does that mean? It means that the principle of mathematical induction is never applicable if your successor is lazy. So you can write a function from n to n, and it ain't what you think it is if you think you're talking, or nat to nat, if you think you're talking about the natural numbers. Lazy languages cannot, do not, cannot, will not ever, under no circumstances, have inductively defined types. I don't care what they call them. There's no natural numbers. There are no lists. There are no trees. There are no inductive types. 
for the reason that I'm talking about now. This is a feature? Like, what is good about that? Nothing, okay? <laughs> it's horrible. Now you might want to say, you might say, I want to have this sort of animal in addition to the natural numbers. Good, I'm all in favor of that. But when you make a blanket language level distinction about a uh, commitment to like, this is going to be eager or something like that, this is one example of many, okay, I have to explain more, then you're screwed. You've completely made a mess. You've screwed up the whole world. You don't even have the natural numbers. Jesus, okay? That's a completely terrible. And I will mention, for, for the reasons that are come up, gonna come up next, simply deciding that successor is eager but maintaining everything else is lazy doesn't fix the problem. Okay, people will tell you that, okay? It's wrong, not true, okay? So here's the second thing. What about call by name or call by value? So the critical thing was, I can get it down to the main thing, uh, E prime. This steps to E prime for X, E. We kind of agree on that, provided that E prime is a value or not. So if it's in there, it's call by value, and if it's not in there, it's call by name. I think I mentioned this before. No one on earth knows why it's called call by name, okay? It's just a word. <laughs> name, I, I, I don't know, I don't know what it means, okay? But it's a long-standing tradition. Okay, so uh, it's called call my name, okay? So the, here's the second problem. Why the successor problem does not fix the issue at all, okay? What is the typing rule for application? To. This is the thing I will call attention to. Okay, that's the typing rule. The question is, okay, the following thing. If you want to be in a position whereby it makes a difference whether you evaluate this guy, what it means is you have to allow for the possibility and call by name that this reduction applies even when that diverges. Okay, which means that when you look at the typing, you must have the possibility the meaning of the typing judgment changes. In Ed's terminology, you're working in a different category. The maps are different. So there are two interpretations. When you're working in an eager language, the meaning is if it has a value, if has a value, if E has a value, okay, in general for any E, then it is of type tau. In the lazy case is, it, oh sorry, in the lazy case it means something completely different. It means that E is a computation possibly divergent of type tau. Okay, they have two completely different meanings. So I'll write possibly divergent of type tau. Okay, that's what it means. The reason you need to be working in a different category is you must have a typing judgment that allows me to put in as an argument something which diverges for which this, uh, for which this substitution makes sense. You've got to have this as a map. Okay? So you might think it's just a localized thing, call by, call by this, call by that. No. It's whether you're working in a certain category. So what this means is, in a lazy language, the way I will summarize it is, you won't like this, but it's true, Divergence is a value. Whereas in an, eager in an eager language, divergence is an effect. It's an effect that happens when you evaluate it. You're saying something about its value, but something happens while you evaluate it. Maybe it diverges. Here you're saying something about the computation as a thing, and the way to think about this is divergence is a value because if this is divergent, what am I plugging in for x? If there's nothing there, there's nothing there. There's nothing to plug in. So you must commit to the idea that divergence is a value. And now you're screwed because even if you make your successors easy, you still don't have the natural numbers in a lazy, in a lazy language because now you, even if you make them easy, e uh, even if you make successor eager by having a strictness annotation, whatever they're called, you nevertheless have an additional element, which is a value 
of type net, or bottom we call it, uh, a value of net. So once again, the principle of mathematical induction does not apply because it's no longer the case that every number is zero or a successor. It could be bottom. Ah, this is a feature? Why is this a feature? It's a bug. It's a huge bug, okay, in my opinion. That's a gigantic error. So this is what's called the paucity of types problem, okay? The paucity of types problem is, oh, if you're so in love with laziness, then you're giving up on, half, so to speak, half the types in the world. You cannot have trees, you cannot have lists, you cannot have natural numbers. You can't even have Booleans. Ever thought about that? Oh, because you have to have the undefined Boolean. This is good? Not a good idea. We, if we want to have both of these things, I, that's no problem, okay? But the language level commitment is wrong. So you see, now stepping back for a minute, why is, e, why is PCF the E. coli of programming languages? Think of all the things I've been able to teach you just in this last hour just by looking at PCF. Isn't it cool? Everything, like lots and lots and lots of things are contained in this one little organism, okay? And we can study that one little guy under the microscope and learn lots about programming languages. So uh, that's why, uh, that's why I, I want to teach about PCF, why I think it's so important. It's like really extremely useful. Okay, so that's what I want to so let me catch my, catch my thoughts. Okay, so I want to now talk a bit about uh, logical equivalence and reasoning about programs that involve divergence. So that's my next point. So any questions? So I think this is all I have to say about, so to speak, the language itself. I hope that at least one of you will try to code up GCD in Gödel's T. Um, it'll be interesting to see what you come up with. <coughs> But the hint is, you got to make it obvious that it terminates. And, the, and, and in Gödel's T, the only way to make, something, to make it obvious that something terminates is to go down by ones. But the GCD equations go down by leaps and bounds, m minus n or even m mod n, okay? They're not going by ones. But you have to programming it in a, program it in a language that forces you to go by ones. That's where the rub is. Okay. All right, say no more. And everything I'm saying, I'm not uh, making a diagnosis of Gödel's T per se. I'm saying Gödel's T illustrates something that, uh, and the, the claims I'm making carry right over no matter which, you know, if, even if you're working in T++. Okay, you, you will still have the problem that there's only a certain number of ways to show something terminates, and then you're going to have misery trying to shoehorn your code into that. Okay, that's what I want to get at. Yes? How is the statics for function application different from the What's regular that? ones? Yeah, what How about? How is statics different? It seems like the same rule as before. Well, it, looks like, it does look like that, but the question is, what is the meaning of the typing judgment? So when I write down like logical relations, uh, okay, I'm... Yeah, I only have 20 minutes. Look in the book, okay? When you write down logical relations, that's telling you the behavioral conditions that are induced by typing. They're different in, a, in the category with divergence being a value from the one in which divergence is an effect. The real difference between the eager and lazy languages, it's not the call by name, that's just uh, the smoke. The engine is you're working in a different category, okay? So that's what's uh, really important, okay? So I can't, I'm not in a position to explain it all. But it's all to do with what does that syntax mean, and that's expressed during lo with logical relations. Okay, so now I want to get across. I only have a few minutes remaining, so I have to uh, think about what I'm going to do here. Okay. Okay, so uh, for the sake of expedience, and well, yeah, because it simplifies matter, I have to think, I, I have to edit my, uh, my plans in my head. I have to figure out what I want to do. So what I want to do is, uh, first thing is, it is completely easy, because you just do the exact same thing, to define contextual equivalence or observational equivalence.
for PCF. So we can write E. OK, we can do that. What do we mean by that? You do the exact same thing you did before, except that your notion of context is PCF context. So you take any PCF context of ground type natural numbers, plug these two guys in. You'll actually have to do this with, with uh, free variables. Oh, no, the way Dan said it up. No, it's we, we took advantage of higher order functions. We only have to define it for closed. OK, and so uh, uh, you can define that in the same way. And you can show it's the coarsest consistent congruence. That all everything carries over is exactly the same. Okay, all right. So we can do this. Now the question is, we want to characterize using logical equivalence. So for the sake of expediency. I will use the exact same looking definition uh, for logical equivalence as I did for Gödel's T. So what I'll do is for the lazy case, because it, it allows me to make the comparison easily, I thought I would have a little more time, we will define this as in T. In other words, the clauses look exactly the same, but it's for PCF, in other words, the expressions are for PCF. So in particular, we will say uh, E is related at nat to E prime. Oh yeah, you have to be careful. All right, so this is, uh, this is, uh, this is a little uh, tricky. But the, the uh, oh yeah, God, uh, I'm editing on the fly. So let me get this right. So we want to say less, less than right. So we want to say that if E evaluates to Z, then E prime evaluates to Z. And if uh, E evaluates the successor of E1, then E uh, prime evaluates the successor of E1 prime. And they are related. And conversely. So. The thing I want to allow is, conversely means set it up so that the primes and the E primes are swapped. Okay, not conversely, but symmetrically or whatever. Uh, convert, yeah, symmetrically. Really, the way you do this is you define uh, a preorder first for E to be less than E prime, and that's this clause. And then equality just means both hold. So in order to be expedient, I won't uh, do it with the preorder. It's important to do the preorder because what is the idea here is that I want divergence at nat to be the same at nat as divergence at nat. I want to set the conditions so that you're not required to evaluate to Z, but if you do, then the other guy must, and conversely. And if you evaluate the success of the other guy must, then they must be related. You do it, you define it like that. Okay? So we want this to be the case. That's what's important. And then we do. A prime, if and only if, uh, as before, now if we we're doing the eager language, it would get a little bit more involved, which I don't have time to do, and that's really the answer to your question. Okay? All right, so this is what we're doing. Okay, so we define it like this. Okay, and now what we want to do is we want to show if in PCF, well, this is the thing we're going to want to show. If in PCF E is of type tau, then it is self-related at tau. That's what we want to do. Okay? And how do we do this? Well, we have to strengthen it to account for the free variables. You know how to do that. And we go by induction on the typing. So that's why in lecture one I was careful to show you how to invent all the parts of that proof. So I'm going to assume you know what to do. You have to prove something stronger. And I want to cut to the chase to see where, where the problem lies. OK? So where do you get into trouble? So you get into trouble at a certain point when you're trying. So everything goes exactly like PCF. 
Okay, the proof is exactly like PCF, except at this point. How are we going to show that fix x dot e is self-related at some type tau to fix x dot e prime, given that whenever I have, uh, let's see, what should I write down? Uh, e1 is related at tau to e1 prime implies that e1 for x e is self-related as related at e1 prime for x e prime. Because remember the typing rule, which is up there on the upper left, the induction hypothesis gives us this fact when we're doing the proof of the fundamental theorem. So we have that, and what we want to show is that, okay? Now we have some difficulties uh, going on here because tau is arbitrary. See, so that's the important point here, the tau is arbitrary. So I have to figure out now, how do I show that these two fixes that are related to themselves, given that their bodies are related to themselves for anything we plug in. So this is not so obvious, but it brings up a very important idea, which is a compactness property of evaluation. Okay, so are you with me so far? So let me cut to the chase. I can see some of you getting antsy, but like this is an important moment, okay? Tau is arbitrary. Let me just cut, everything can be worked out, it's in the book, all right? Let me just cut to the chase, see what's really going on. What do we know about tau? It has to be of the form, you know, tau zero, partial arrow, tau one, arrow, arrow, nat. Just look at it by induction. I don't know what the taus are, they're anything. But it's gotta be error, 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 nat. That's the only possibility. But nat is the only base case. And so this is what types look like, okay? So what happens is, it suffices to show that the fix x dot e when applied to e0, e1, so this is a bound variable for all e, so I'm just, uh, don't confuse those two. This is a bound variable up there. Okay, e0, e1, all the way down to whatever it is, e, e, k, is related at nat to fix x dot e uh, prime, uh, e0 prime, da, 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 e, k prime. This is what will happen, because you're gonna keep breaking down the type. And when you break down the type, you're gonna use the arrow rule over there on the left which means you're gonna apply it to E0 and E0 prime related, E1 and E1 prime related, all the way up EK to EK prime related. But now they're of type nat, okay? So how do I prove the two expressions are related to type nat? I look at their execution behavior. Oh, so the proof is you suppose that the left-hand side evaluates to, let's say, zero. That's, there were several clauses, but one of the clauses is this, okay? And then what I have to do is to show that the right-hand side evaluates to zero. What do I do here? How do I go about doing this? Well, here is the critical idea. Take this expression. It that's this guy. It evaluates to zero. What, does anybody have any inkling of where I'm heading here? What can I do? So I'm going to apply the following thing, which is called the compactness property, which is in the book. It's called that because it's related to the notion of compactness and topology, which sort of says if an infinite amount of stuff suffices, then a finite amount of stuff. Uh, if you have an infinite amount of stuff in a situation, then a finite amount is good enough. So the idea is this there has to exist a finite k such that, and I'll write it as fixed to the k x dot e applied to e0 
through E. Oh, sorry, I shouldn't have called it K. So let's call this, that's my mistake, let's call that N, okay? So EK also evaluates the Z. What am I saying? If you have any terminating program and you run it, the while loops only went around for a certain amount of times. Even though a while loop can go around as many times as you like, in any given fixed scenario where you get an actual outcome, only a certain amount of the unrolling of the while is needed. So what this means is, this is the, uh, this guy here, is the n-fold unrolling of the fix. In other words, I just do the substitution. Fix x, for, fix x minus 1 for x in E, fix x minus 2, da, 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 all the way down to fix 0, which is bottom. Okay? That is the important property. It's only true at NAT. Why would that be? Well, this is tricky. It's a part, part of higher order programming. If I evaluate to something which is not of base type, like, the, like uh, 0 here, I can embed within it a use of fix can show up in the output you will not get the exact same answer in that scenario. So it's complicated. But what logical relations does is it drives it down to the base type so we can do this. And then we use something called fixed point induction. And then I'll finish here. So look at fixed point induction, specialized to this particular situation. And what I will say is this. To show that the two fixes are related at any type tau E prime, it suffices to show that for every n bigger than or equal to zero, their nth approximation are related. And we do this by induction on n. Because the idea is that if all of this holds, then that holds. And what is the idea? The idea is this. Let me just call it f to the 0, f to the 1. In a sense that I haven't made precise, bottom approximates the one unrolling, approximates the two unrolling, and has a limit, which is f, which is the whole fix. In other words, f is essentially the soup, n greater than or equal to zero. That's the first fact. and Everything is continuous. This is the idea, okay? Everything is continuous, meaning that I, if I do anything with, uh, that everything preserves limits. If I plug in, uh, if I plug in the, uh, if I do something for all the phi's, then it, it works for the limit. It passes to the limit. It's continuity. Everything, so I'll just write that in quotes. So there's a notion of continuity, which is preserves limits. Now, in this particular case, all I'm saying is, when you drive this down to base type, you're going to care only about a finite unrolling of the fix. And the same will be over here. But all the finite unrollings are related. So therefore, whatever that finite unrolling is, pick the one you proved, and then that will give you the result you need. That's the end. That's how it works. OK? So the critical points here, as I finish, I'm sorry to be a little bit brief, but it is in the book. You need to know this compactness. You need to know that you only need a finite amount of any recursively defined thing in order to get a definite finite answer. And you then uh, prove as a theorem fixed point induction that says if something holds for all the approximants, then it holds in the limit. Okay? That's the idea. Okay, so that is the that is the uh, what it, uh, was going on, and Amal is going to use this essential idea in a technique called step indexing. So when Amal brings up step indexing, this is what she's talking about. She's talking about 
the compactness property of evaluation. Okay, there are a lot of subtleties and technicalities into what I'm saying. I'm not proving everything for you, but I hope I'm giving you the flavor of what is going on. So the critical thing is, when you have unbounded recursion, the way you, realize, you reason about it is using fixed point induction. To use fixed point induction, however, it works in this situ situation for the logical relation I'm giving you because it turns out to be what is called an admissible predicate. So then there's a notion of admissibility from last time. Admissible predicates or admissible relations are those for which this principle is valid. So in general, if I have R here, it is not the case that every R satisfies this property. That is, if all the unrollings have R, then therefore the limits have R. No, what's an example? All the finite unrollings of a loop halt, but the loop doesn't have to halt, okay? So when you pass to the limit, the property of halting does not preserve by passing to the limit. So such a predicate is inadmissible. So the reason for considering admissible predicates is the original meaning of admissible, and I've generalized it because it's applicable in all different situations. The original meaning is admits fixed point induction. Not every relation admits fixed point induction, but the logical equivalence does. And so that's what I'm using here in order to give the argument. Okay, so that's a little brief shoveling in things to prepare for, to prepare for our Malls lectures, but I want you to understand is that you know, for admissible predicates, uh, re relations, okay, of which logical equivalence is one, okay? So don't make the mistake of saying fixed point induction always works for everything. No, not true, okay? It only works for uh, admissible predicates. So, okay, so that's what I have to say uh, in this lecture this morning. Let's take a coffee break, and then Dan will start talking about FPC. So uh, uh, we'll take it up from there. Okay, thanks very much for your attention.